Hello everyone, I wanted to just make a brief video about the final exam for this class. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I want to be clear that the final exam will cover everything that we've read. So you should, you'd expect a one question about each reading. Uh, you'll have uh, three hours to finish the exam. The way that I've set it up is that once you click on here, final exam, uh, you should see some instructions. Uh, the exam is timed to three hours, 180 minutes. Answers must be submitted within that time. Now, the way that I set it up was that um, you should be able to open and close the exam <clears throat> uh, as many times as you want within the three-hour period so that if you lose your internet connection or your computer crashes or whatever, um, you should be able to get back into the exam. So that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I've also put auto submit on, so your answers should be saved um, on a regular uh, time period. I don't know what every whatever minutes or so. So you shouldn't be in danger of losing any work. Um, but uh, you're more expert at taking online exams than I am. But once you open it, you'll have three hours to submit your answers, um, and uh, that so you can only open it. You can only, you know, you have to, you can open it as many times as you want, but you have to finish it within three hours of opening it. So I hope that that's clear. It's pretty, it's actually a pretty simple thing and I'll make it more complicated. I'm serious about this warning here. Uh, there is always the possibility <clears throat> when I leave an exam open and don't have it at a particular time that students will share the answers with other students who haven't taken the exam yet. Do not do that. Um, <clears throat> if I were to, you know, find out that you did it, it would be grounds for failure of the class and university discipline because it would be cheating. Um, so what I'm supposing is that everyone's going to take the exam on their own without consulting anyone else. I mean, obviously you can consult whatever text you want, although I don't think you would really need to do that given the kind of questions I'm asking, but you can certainly do that. If you'd like, read over the text, read over whatever you like. Um, just do not, do, do not give me any answers that are based upon secondary sources, especially if you're going to quote from them. Um, so uh, you can certainly consult the text that we've read as much as you want, but I'm really hoping that I'm not going to get any answers out of Wikipedia or something like that, because that, those wouldn't be good answers. And if you insist upon using secondary sources, and I'm telling you not to, but if you insist on using secondary sources, make sure that you cite your source. And if you were to copy and paste from secondary sources, obviously that would constitute plagiarism, and that would mean that you wouldn't get any credit for your answer. So um, what sort of questions should you expect? Well, I've written what I consider to be straightforward questions that require straightforward answers. Uh, the, the questions, all of with all, all of the questions in my mind, uh, zero in on a central point in the argument of the text. They ask questions that um, I think anybody who was familiar with the text would be prepared to answer uh, immediately because they don't ask, I, I don't think about things that are obscure or um, things that are that, that are uh, secondary in the text. They, all of the questions zero in on what, in my judgment, are the central um, aspects of the text, of the argument of the text. Let's take a really simple example here. Uh, uh, Anselm's uh, argument, the Prislogion for the existence of God. Um, get into the argument here. This argument is, uh, you know, not about, oh, Lord, do you give understanding to faith? That's the preamble. The argument itself uh, starts with this notion of a being than which none greater can be conceived. And then, you know, this part right here. And then what he thinks logically follows from us conceiving of, of such a being, a being than which no, nothing greater can be conceived. That is... These are the things that I zeroed in on, that I concentrated on in my uh, videos, especially the second look videos. Um, another simple 
example, because it's a short argument, is uh, Epicurus's letter to Minoicus. Uh, this is, you know, this is about death, right? And it's a very brief argument that uh, death is nothing to us. And he gives his reasons. That's what I'll be focusing on. Um, something that's more uh, complicated, more complex argument, or more, you know, an argument that goes, has more detail to it, is the argument about, um, <clears throat> the argument, uh, first of all, I can tell you, I will not be focusing on the kind of this, this introductory part, which is basically his, you know, a, a summary, a very brief summary of, of his reasons for thinking that human beings evolved. No, I will be focusing on the latter part, you know, of the uh, text. And I'll even tell you, I won't be focusing on the intellectual powers. I will be focusing on his arguments for our moral disposition, which is basically his argument in evolutionary terms about how it could be possible that human beings could have evolved, that morality could have evolved naturally uh, in the human species. That is what, so, so you should be concentrating on, um, you know, the, the part that begins here, the development of the moral qualities. Um, you know, something, uh, something simple like the prince. Right? I mean, it should be completely, completely obvious what the argument here is in the prince. The argument is about love and fear. And yes, sure, he says, if you're a prince, you would like to have both. But the whole thing, I mean, that's not the conclusion of it, right? The, the whole thing is not going towards, well, you should have both. No, the whole thing is going towards... If you can't have both, you should choose fear over love and, and his reasons for, for that. I mean, I'll be sticking to these things, which I, I think are, you know, pretty obvious. Um, you know, this one here, uh, a little more different, I would say, from Locke, uh, zeroing in on it as political philosophy and keeping in mind <clears throat> that maybe the most striking thing that he says here is this excerpt here, the great and chief end, therefore, of men's uniting into commonwealths and putting themselves under government is the preservation of their property. I mean, if we translate that into more straightforward, modern, contemporary language, he's basically saying that the, the main function of government and the reason for its existence is the preservation of property. And, you know, keep in mind what he means by property, right? So I'm looking for careful readings of the text and an understanding of the basic argument. Let's see. Um, a tough one. Wittgenstein's lecture on ethics. Wow. I just finished my second look video. I'd been putting that off because it's very challenging. But keep in mind, you know, watch the video. You'll, you'll get a, a definite sense of what I think the argument is and what I think is important. So... Um, I said in that video that it's clear that we could take the overall conclusion of this lecture to be that ethics is nonsense. Uh, why would he think that? What's his argument for it? That's what you should be thinking of in terms of this class. This was a class on critical thinking. And so it was a class that focused on logic, uh, and w which means it's a class that focused on argument, which means that it's a class that focused on conclusions and the support for those conclusions. So you should read every one of these texts in that way. Uh, and um, that should that should be your 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 guide. Now, yeah, I mean, some of uh, the texts, especially something like the Euthyphro is more wide ranging. Uh, but the question I asked about it, I think, is a very central question uh, about the Euthyphro, maybe the most striking thing that Socrates says in the Euthyphro, so it, it shouldn't come as any surprise. So, um, if you, I've ranged over almost all the texts here to give you a sense of, uh, you know, what I'm what I'm thinking in terms of them. To supplement this video, you should definitely, definitely be looking at the videos for the course, both the initial videos that I put up during the week when we were looking at the readings and especially the second look videos in which I, I basically 
give away what I think the argument of each one of these texts is and go into more detail. So if you haven't been looking at those videos, uh, even if you have, you should be taking a look at those in conjunction with rereading the texts as a way of um, studying for the final exam. I do not think there'll be any surprises, or there shouldn't be any surprises. If you've <clears throat> read these texts, written about them, watch the videos, uh, if you go back to these texts with all that in mind, all that experience, and reread them, you shouldn't have any surprises when it comes to the kind of questions that will be on the final exam. Uh, the exam uh, will be timed to three hours, etc. Don't share the answers, but there'll be one question about each reading, and. Um, Yes, your answer should be an essay form, but it's not really going to be, it's not going to be an essay answer. I would say that I put a rough um, estimate of the length of answers to be between one and two paragraphs. I think it'll rarely take two paragraphs. It'll rarely take more than one paragraph. And some answers will only take a sentence or two to adequately answer. That is, the questions are straightforward. They don't ask for complete ask you to completely review the text, or they don't ask you to develop an idea in essay form, they ask fairly straightforward reading knowledge questions, which can be answered in a straightforward way. So how long your, your answer needs to be, uh, it will vary, but that's part of the exam is knowing the text well enough that you can use your judgment to determine how long an, how long an answer needs to be to be a sufficient good answer. It will vary because the texts vary and the questions vary. Um, but I think that if you're confident about your reading of these works, then you should not, that should not really be a problem trying to figure out how long an answer needs to be. An answer needs to be correct. And, um, you know, there are short answers which are correct. There are long answers which are incorrect. So just because an answer is long doesn't mean that it's a good answer. And just because an answer is short, doesn't mean it's a bad answer. It really depends on what you say. So I would say that the length of answers is really not important. What's important is that you get what I'm asking in the question, that you're familiar enough with the text that you can sort of identify in the t what in the text is, is crucial and that you can put things in your own words. I would say that even though this is an at-home exam, that you should keep quoting to a minimum. That is as much as possible, put things in your own words. Because if you simply use quotes, then I can't be sure that you really understand those quotes. If you quote something and then you explain in your own words what it means, that is much, much better for you as a test taker than simply uh, putting up a quote without your own interpretation of what it means. So let's just make that a rule that quoting should be kept to a minimum and the premium here, what you should really be focusing on is putting the ideas in your own words. Uh, if you would like to contact me before you take the exam in, in the course of your study, if you have any questions you'd like to have clarified regarding the text, uh, any particular questions, please let me know. Give me a call or uh, email me and I'll be happy to talk to you. Good luck, everyone.